carve a few Chinese lattice windows to frame the harmony between heaven and humankind. Build a long corridor of the East to reach the innermost depths of history and culture. It is a meandering melody of Suzhou music, sung with grace and elegance. It is some simple sketches of mountains and forests, not wanting in detail and delicacy. Pick a thousand pieces of lakeside rock in all shapes and contours. Take a share of the Suzhou waters with all the mist and haze. Paint a dozen scrolls of floral light and watery shadow. Write a few chapters about the fading years and distant times. Chinese culture has a long tradition of flowers and trees personifying human values. Plum, orchid, bamboo, and chrysanthemum are known as the four gentlemen. Pine, bamboo, and plum are the three friends of winter. For their quiet elegance, their uprightness, their resilience in severe winter, these plants personified the values that the literati would like to emulate. On the other hand, what we find in the Suzhou Gardens is also the artistic integration of man-made landscape and natural environment. What these gardens try to achieve is the unity between heaven and humankind. The numerous flowers and trees best represent the ecological essence of the natural environment. Therefore, the horticultural design of the garden is never oversimplified nor are species of plants in the garden limited to plum, orchid, bamboo, and chrysanthemum. As a matter of fact, the ancient garden builders considered rockery building, water surface design, architecture, and horticulture the four major components of garden art. Their creative use of plants speaks to the affinity between humanity and nature. Different species of nature intermingle here, such that coming to the gardens, you cannot but realize what the 6th century poet Wang Zi felt. The noise of the cicadas make the forest all the more quiet. The chirping of the birds make the mountain all the more tranquil. The multifaceted scenery of nature blend all its variations into one, so that indulging in its myths, you cannot but recreate the spiritual atmosphere of the Song Dynasty poet Yan Shu. Pear blossoms in the courtyard and the hazy moon willow catkins over the pond in the soft breeze. From the visual experience of flowers and willows concealing the view, the auditory experience of rain pattering on the withering lotus, the olfactory experience of drifts of faint scent, you gather the sensation of emotional freedom and spiritual ease. One can say that without the spirit of the flowers and trees, there can be no ambience of a garden. Horticulture in Suzhou Gardens has its own rules. Each of the tall trees, like pine and ginkgo, has its intent, while each grove of bushes, like the verdure bamboo, has its rationale. These century-old trees are precious symbols of ancient ecology, hallmarks of historical gardens, as well as objects of aesthetic appreciation. If any of these ancient trees already existed at the time the garden was built, the garden builder would always leave sufficient space for it to become one of the scenic attractions of the garden. The garden builders of the past not only left for posterity an antiquarian tree, but also the memorable teaching, a carved beam is easy to construct, but an ancient tree is hard to cultivate. The lively plants in the Suzhou Gardens are vital to the lifeless architecture. With the help of the plants, 
the interior and exterior of these buildings are able to resonate with their natural surroundings. That is why many of the scenic spots in the gardens are named after plants and their symbolic meanings, such as the loquat orchard in the humble administrator's garden, the small house at flower docks in the lingering garden, and the lounge house with bamboo and a branch of plum in the master of fishing nets garden. The Lower Yangtze Valley, rich in water resources, has both high humidity and warm temperature. This allows a sumptuous variety of plants to grow in the gardens. Records show that over a hundred families of plants, including trees, flowers and vines, totaling 250 species, are found in the Suzhou Gardens. Faced with such a large number of species, the garden builders have been meticulous in their placing and arrangement of these plants. They take into consideration the plant's shapes and colors, especially the human values they personify, in order to create the appropriate ambiance and landscape for the entire garden. Some of the plants look magnificent, others just plain. They either enhance the elegant ambience of the secluded courtyards, or create the idyllic atmosphere of melon vines and beanstalks. Even in selecting the lotus that adorns the water surface, how many heads to plant or whether to plant any at all is the object of careful design. The humble administrator's garden has a total area of 11.5 acres, of which one-third is water surface. Accordingly, the garden builders put in large patches of lotus. The master of fishing nets garden, on the other hand, has only 1.5 acres of space. To maintain a sense of vastness for the pond's imaginary waves and ripples, None of those scented and rouged beauties have a place here. Lotus is a flowering perennial water plant that can either grow out in the wild in lakes and swamps or take root in the fragrant gardens of residential complexes. Throughout its long history, the lotus has evolved into a culture with rich spiritual content. Scholars say that the lotus emerges from the mud untainted. The Buddha says, human beings are no different from lotus. Every person is endowed with his unique prenatal conditions. For its rich symbolism, people cultivate lotus, and in doing so, they also cultivate themselves. Because the original garden owners relished the virtues of lotus, it has become a traditional flower for some of the gardens. But garden owners also love other flowers. For instance, the orchids in the pavilion of Surging Waves Garden and the peonies of the Lingering Garden have enjoyed long-lasting fame far and near. While the humble administrator's garden is famous for its rock and water, its lotus is also the number one topic of conversation for lovers of Sucho garden flowers. The lotus in this garden has always been a major scenic attraction. Many of the buildings bear names related to lotus, such as the Lotus Waterside Pavilion, the Hall of Distant Fragrance, the Fragrant Islet, the Pavilion of Lotus Breeze from all four directions, the Stay and Listen Tower, the Lotus Fragrance Waterside Pavilion, etc. If you string these names together, they are like the conjoined segments of a lotus root. There is a long relationship between the lotus and Suzhou. More than 2,500 years ago, on the Lingyan Mountain, on the outskirts of Suzhou, King Fu Cha of Wu built the Guanwa Palace for the Yue beauty Si Shi. Wa in Suzhou dialect means beautiful girl. On the site of the palace are the historical remains of a pond called the Enjoy the Flowers Pond. The name suggests that the lotus planted here was for viewing, but in the East Qing dynasty, lotus came to be planted in vats. And in the Ming dynasty, there emerged what's called bowl lotus. Bowl lotus first appeared in the courtyards of Suzhou. It has a history of several hundred years. Before the Cultural Revolution, we had an elderly gentleman named Lu Bin Shi, who was famous for his bowl lotus. In those days, there was a Peng Jing expert in Suzhou, the venerable Mr. Zhou Shou Zhuan. He named the hall of his house Lotus Loving Hall. 
In this hall, he displayed every year the bowl lotus that Mr. Liu gave him. But when the Cultural Revolution came, old man Lu was exiled to northern Jiangsu, and there was no one left in Suzhou who knew how to grow bowl lotus. He was simply missing for the next two or three decades. The bowl lotus that Mr. Lu Bingshi of Suzhou raised used to be called earthen bowl lotus. Mr. Lu was very particular about the utensils he used to raise his lotus in. He insisted that for this kind of desktop display, it was essential to use exquisite antique porcelain bowls. That was how bowl lotus got its name. It is a household plant that everyone loves. It is very popular in the Suzhou area and is widespread throughout Jiangsu and Zhejiang. Actually, this distinctive way of raising lotus came down from earlier times. He first ground both ends of a lotus seed until they were flat, then placed it inside an eggshell, which he put underneath a hatching hen. When young chicks came out of their shells, he took the seed out of his and buried it in the soil in an earthen bowl. The soil was also special because it had to be the dirt of a swallow's nest, mixed in with some lucid asparagus, a medicinal herb, pounded into a well-mixed mash. He then put the seed in this soil, poured in some river water, and put it in the morning sunlight. When the stalk grew up, the flower looked like a wine cup, really graceful. This sounds like a digression, but from this we can see Suzhou people's liking for delicate and exquisite craftsmanship, as well as the intense elegance of their lifestyle and taste. In fact, bowl lotus and gardens have something in common. Don't the Suzhou gardens also use the device of capturing the big in the small and shrinking a dragon into an inch to blend themselves into the larger space between heaven and earth? Plants are an important factor in uniting the garden architecture with natural space. Indoor plants and flowers and desktop vase are good devices, but they are not as full of vitality as the various kinds of outdoor flowers and trees that reach for the windows and the emerald greenery that leans towards the doorway. To achieve this kind of effect, the garden builders of Suzhou carve out space for small yards between some of the halls and lounges and place rocks and plants in them. These small courtyards create the impression that there are rocks and plants within a building, and there are buildings in the midst of rocks and plants, such that there is no longer any distinction between interior and exterior. We cannot talk about viewing the plants and landscape of the gardens without mentioning the windows. There are different kinds of windows in the gardens, the casementless window, the tracery window, and the flower window. The tracery window is the ultimate stroke of genius of garden art. Its concept is innovative. Its designs are so numerous that you can hardly find a repetition. This type of window is both practical and ornamental, a work of art in and of itself. It is the flower windows exquisitely made that enable people to enjoy the scenery of the gardens from indoors. In classical Chinese poetry and prose, Expressions that include the word window enjoy extremely high frequency, such as green appearing through the window gauze, shadows of bamboo in the window, before the window and beneath the moon. During the Song Dynasty, some poets simply used the word window or chuang in their style names. For instance, Wu Wenying called himself Meng Chuang or Dream Window, and Zhou Mi's name was Cao Chuang or Grass Window. Together, they were known as the two windows. Windows are primarily used for their practical values, but because they create the visual impression of framed pictures, they often provide unique viewpoints from which to enjoy the beauty of nature. The windows in the Suzhou Gardens bring this aesthetic function to new heights. With garden windows as picture frames, you can never see enough of the charms of pink peach blossoms and green willows. You can never see enough of the hazy image of towers wrapped in mists. You can never see enough of the heartiness of bamboo swaying in plum breeze. 
you can never see enough of the loveliness of clear ice and pure jade. Through the tracery windows, you can appreciate the scenery that changes with the seasons and hours, but still you feel somewhat limited by the framework preset by the garden builders. Actually, the most important aesthetic characteristic of Suzhou Gardens lies in the fact that the scenery changes with every step the viewer takes. You can also say that your appreciation changes with the change of viewpoints and time. To discover the hidden beauty of the garden, therefore, you have to have a special vision. That special vision is the tracery window in your own heart. Did you notice this interplay of light and shade? Did you notice this composition? Did you notice this perspective? Did you notice this depth of field? Garden art excels in its exquisite details. To appreciate the gardens, you must explore its minute details. To take good pictures of Suzhou Gardens, you have to observe the seasonal changes throughout the year. Not only that, there is also the change of light within a day. Let me give you an example. The best time in Suzhou to see the willows leafing is around March 8th. Willows just begin to leaf at the end of February, but the best time is between March 8th and March 12th. Take also the lotus leaves in the Suzhou Gardens. The best effect of lotus leaves dotting the water surface occurs in the week between May 4th and May 10th. The sense of early summer feels really good. I also take photos of the tracery windows in the Garden of Happiness, casting the shadow on the double corridors. Every year, I wait until the week between November 20 and November 26. The best time is November 25th, between 9.40 and 9.45 a.m. Only those five minutes to take the shots. Of course, not everyone has the chance to capture those beautiful moments of light and shade in the Suzhou Garden. Even if you do encounter such a moment, you have to be in a certain mood to appreciate its peacefulness and serenity. Without the right mood, there can be no appreciation to speak of. The opposite of this receptive mood is restlessness. Originally, these gardens were built for a small number of people to use and enjoy. But today, they have become antique objects for public display. When there are too many visitors, the place becomes noisy and loses its tranquility. Needless to say, with the pace of life increasing daily, more and more people lose the ability to appreciate the beauty of the gardens. That is the way things are in this world. Getting acquainted is not difficult, but true understanding is rarely easy. In ancient times, the Suzhou Gardens were residential gardens, that is, the dwelling places of the literati elite. In addition to the garden's historical and artistic values, their residential and garden components are woven together into an organic whole to make an excellent environment for living. The ideal environment for living is one of harmony between people and nature. This harmony manifests itself in daily life when people enjoy the aesthetic pleasures of both art and nature. Such pleasures may be sought among the top branches of a garden's tall trees, or amidst the lotus leaves on a pond within the garden's walls. Where there are treetops, there is the bright moon sailing past the branches, 
where there is a lotus pond, there you may hear the chorus of frogs. The harmony of a garden embraces the idyllic beauty of nature and echoes with its surroundings. It has an ambience of its own. When I first came to Suzhou, I was 15 or 16 years old. We had relatives here, and they knew some of the garden people. At that time, one of my relatives knew the owner of the twin garden, so I moved into the twin garden. I came here to convalesce from an illness. Then I started reading all day. The impression the garden gave me was just wonderful. It was like a fantasy world, especially in the evenings. There was no one in the garden in the evening. Actually, there was no one there in the daytime either in those days. There was a pond in the garden, a famous lotus pond. There were lots of frogs in the pond, also a lot of carp, big carp. Outside the garden wall was the city moat. At that time, the city wall was still standing, so there were frogs outside as well. These frogs really barked with gusto. When those inside started croaking, those outside also started roaring. It was like thunder. You couldn't hear anything else. But all of a sudden they would stop. It was really strange. When they stopped, they all stopped. Then you heard the tsi sound of the carp breathing under the lotus leaves. After a while, the frogs started singing again, drowning out all other sounds. From that time on, the art of the Suzhou Gardens quietly made an impact on me. I also lived in the Master of Fishing Nets garden once. This garden was really pretty in the evening. Many people don't know that the gardens in Suzhou can be more beautiful in the evening than in the daytime. At that time, my family lived in a very cramped space. I couldn't write at home because it was too hot and noisy. I knew one of the staff members of the garden quite well. He said, why don't you move into the Master of Fishing Nets garden? There's a boudoir there, it's vacant, but there's a desk and other stuff. There were very few tourists in those days, so I moved in and wrote all day. In the evening, I was the only one in the whole garden. I stayed there for over a month, almost two months. I sat on a rock at the edge of the pond. I turned on the lights in the boudoir. The lights as well as the building were reflected on the pond. Suzhou at the time was a strange city. It was a city with closed doors. The outside looked quite shabby, but if you pushed open a door, lo and behold, the inside was just gorgeous. It turned out to be a huge garden. As gardens for the literati, the Sucho Gardens were designed to be poetic. The idea is similar to that of literati paintings. The literati painters not only pay attention to the pictorial quality of their paintings, but also set great store by the inscriptions. The inscriptions, which may take the form of either lines of poetry or poetic titles, greatly enrich the content of the artwork. The gardens in Sucho are also replete with inscriptions by men of letters. These inscriptions appear on horizontal plaques or as vertical couplets, hung in halls and parlors, or engraved on pavilions and terraces. They are highly literary, while they add to the sophistication of the gardens. They also serve as pointers or guides for the appreciation of the specific scenic attractions, whether they were created for the specific location or taken from existing literature. Most of the inscriptions came from the hands of great masters, whether descriptive or expressive. They are always philosophical. They are both directly pertinent to the subject at hand and perfectly free in their imaginative associations. In fact, they are at once part of the artistry of the gardens and its literary sublimation. All these inscriptions have one common feature. That is, they express the personified spirit of the plants in the mind's eye of the scholars. There is a couplet in the twin garden which best illustrates the merging of the spirit and the scholar-owner's own personality. It reads, Reclining on a rock, I listen to the waves, the color of pine saturating my shirt. Opening the door, I watch the rain, the sound of banana leaves filling the air. Banana is a fast-growing, herbaceous plant with broad and long leaves and tall trunks. 
It often gives one a sense of poise and serenity. A few stalks of banana at the foot of a hillock or next to a secluded window can enhance the dark green hue of the entire garden. In summer, when it is unbearably hot and humid under the blazing sun, the banana leaves give people cool shade. In winter, when the weather in this part of the country is both chilly and damp, the figure of the banana trunk quietly suggests the hope of spring. The banana has no glamorous colors. It is just green, pure and simple, a sign of loftiness. No wonder so many artworks have the banana as their The patter of rain on banana leaves is most evocative. Garden builders must have taken into consideration the special aesthetic effect of garden in rain when they design such buildings as Stay and Listen Tower and Listen to the Rain Lounge. Misty rain fills the enchanting landscape with uninhibited delight. Drizzling rain leaves a soft, whispering sound on the banana leaves, like memories of past events, so vague, so remote. As the rain turns heavier, its drops beat out the distant rhythm of celestial music. If you are listening with rapt attention to the rain on the banana leaves outside your window, the raindrops sliding down the leaves are just like the emotional and mental loads that roll off your heart and mind. Maybe it was under similar circumstances that the garden owners of the past, after laying down their official seals to start playing with seal engraving in retirement, also allowed the wind and rain of their checkered careers to be replaced by the rain on the banana leaves at their windows. Banana may be an eyewitness of the child at play, or a companion of the young student reading at the window or a hometown souvenir for the stranded wanderer, or an intimate confidant of the retiree south of the Yangtze River. People often speak of the ambience of the gardens. What exactly is that? We feel it is an infusion of a sense of the elegant past with the specific and finite objects of the garden. A sense of communion with nature, an understanding of the philosophy of life, as well as an aesthetic experience that it cleanses the soul, as well as an aesthetic experience that cleanses the soul and inspires the imagination. The ambience of the gardens hinges on the garden's landscape. This landscape has the mists and waters of Sujo as its backdrop. It is the result of the artistic designing of water surface and rockery. It takes the form of the deep recesses of courts and yards. But to truly appreciate the gardens requires the willingness to lend one's ear to the patter of rains on banana leaves. To deepen the ambience of the gardens, then, means to transcend all mundane worries so that one can really enjoy the sound of rain on banana leaves outside one's window. <laughs>